Hello, hello, welcome to Quackalope. And today we're diving into a little bit of a different format. Uh, we're doing a series called Right For You, Wrong For You, where by the end of this video, you should know whether or not tapestry is right for you or wrong for you. The way that this video will be broken down is we're going through six major factors that we consider when determining if we're going to add a game into our game collection. Those factors are going to be the mechanics, the theme, the accessibility, the gameplay, the modes of play, the innovation in the gameplay itself, and then finally, the price point. Mm -hmm. Today, we're diving into the well-known tapestry by Stonemeyer Stone <laughs> Games, which has been fairly controversial. So mm -hmm. us being presumptuous enough to say that we could produce a video that'll let you know if you should add this to your collection or not, mm. uh, could be a little outlandish. We'll try our best. We're gonna do our very best. <laughs> so starting at the very beginning, let's touch on the mechanics of this game. Jan, what is the kind of bare bones things you're doing in Tapestry? What is this game all about? Uh, well, you are building a civilization and you'll be building that okay. civilization by extremely abstracted means. You'll be moving up four independent technology tracks that later in the game begin to intertwine depending on how you build out your society. So we have technology, military, science, and explore, mm -hmm. which are standard civ-based terms, but in all essence, mechanically, this is a efficiency management game. Yep. You're doing your very best to gather resources, use those resources to move up these abstract tracks mm -hmm. uh, to generate either more resources or end of game scoring components or mechanics that result in victory points and result in you winning or losing the game. If an abstract efficiency management based game sounds interesting to you, this might be right for you. This game might be right for you. Next, we're gonna tie into theme where a lot of the controversy around this game mm -hmm. has actually been centered. You can see on the front of the box here, it says tapestry, a civilization game. Let's talk mm. about both sides of this conversation, yeah. starting with the civilization theme of the game, which I think we both agree is there. For sure, so for example, in the game, if you start looking at everything from different points of view, you'll start seeing semblances of that theming throughout. For example, the idea of building up on a society, that society determining what type of direction you take with your civilization, the type of technologies that they'll discover depending on them, and when you get access to those technologies starts to make a little bit of sense. However, for someone like me who, who always plays games, even heavy abstract games, with an element of visualization in my brain, Tapestry sort of hit the right chord. I can see how this is a abstracted uh, continent that we're exploring. I can see how my alchemist feeds into the uh, city board that I'm building up, how the resources I use are developing technologies. But on the yeah. other side of that, for people who are used to civilization games in the hard and true sense of what a civilization game is, and I'm meaning Sid Meier's 17 hour long campaign based games, this is mm -hmm. not that no. even close. No. The way I've, I've learned to best describe it is if you took civilization, the video game, and you zoomed out and you kept zooming out, kind of like those space videos, mm -hmm. until you just had a blip of a planet left, mm -hmm. that's where this game rests. Yes. And for me, I don't mind it at all. Not at all. That being said, if you've already listened to kind of those complaints, that discussion, if the idea of theming doesn't matter that much to you and the idea of a really good kind of efficiency management game does, well, this game still might be right for yeah. you. The question is gonna come down then to the accessibility. Talk a little bit about the accessibility of this game. How easy is it to pull onto the table to learn? How likely are you to get it off the shelf? So one of the main lures that Stonemaier Games promoted with this particular game was a four page rule book. Yeah, and the rule book is genuinely four pages. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's as clear as a lot of people wanted it to be. Or mean that all the rules are specifically in the rule book. Every player power comes with a variety of rules. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a little bit of asymmetry with that. Every tapestry card, technology card. What we're saying is it's, not quite as complex no. because it's billed as a simpler game. There really are about four actions you take per round. That's what you're making a decision between. 
but it's also not quite as simple as it's been built. No. There no. is depth, there is complexity, mm -hmm. and more often than not, or more specifically than not, this game lends itself to experience yes. really, really heavily. Yep. So when you're getting this game to the table with a new gaming group, you have to be aware that you'll need to walk them through the course of the gameplay mm -hmm. and be generous to them as you play. If you've played 10 games and they've only played two, the odds of you crushing them are pretty significant. Yeah. That being said, if you're playing with a group of people or you have a core gaming group who enjoy this style of game, this could be an interesting one to learn and grow together as a community. And it'll be easy to teach. Yeah. In terms of that term of accessibility, it is definitely very easy to understand initially on the onset. After that though, that's where that complexity is hidden. It's not, yeah, it's not a hard game to get to the table. Mm -hmm. It is a game though that requires experience to do very well at. Mm -hmm. So if that doesn't bother you, and if you're excited about the idea of a game that rewards bringing it back to the table as often as possible, this might be right for you. This still might be right for you. Let's talk about the gameplay itself, specifically touching on elements that make it right or wrong for us as players in our gaming groups. Yeah, so there's a lot to love in terms of the different stratagems and mechanics that are within this design. Um, the moving up tracks is sufficiently simple yet deep enough that it keeps it interesting. There, there's even points where people have analysis paralysis, and that's tied to the death of potential venues that you can take within the within the, the piece. Well, I can say this. There's a lot of things you can do in this game. Mm -hmm. You can focus on your tapestry cards. You can focus on your civilization. You can explore the world. You can move up these tracks as efficiently and effectively as possible. You can build your city district. You can focus on locking like, late game scoring with mm -hmm. your resources. And the reason I'm aware of all of that is nearly every time I've got this game to the table, I have ventured down one of those different paths. They all feel familiar, but they're all varied and different enough that I felt like I've played a different style of game. Well, you know what? I'm not 100% confident that everything is as variable as you're imp implying because there are certain routes in the game that don't feel as satisfying as mm -hmm. they might feel for somebody that's coming into this with all the hype, saying it's a Civ game, which we've already cleared up, but it's important to clarify. For instance, one of those elements that have been receiving a significant amount of mm -hmm. complaints uh, and is a gameplay element that may make this game wrong for you yeah. is the tapestry cards themselves. Mm -hmm. These are going to be blind draws. These are going to be things that you get throughout the course of the game, uh, either one at a time every time you move forward in your civilization or in your era, or by moving up specific tracks that give you access to additional ones of them. These can be incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. They can script the way you play the game, and they're random. They're yeah. by chance. Yep. So, there are some elements of this game that really shine. There is a potential to play this game in a variety of different ways and have new experiences every time you dive in while the core game's still feeling familiar. Mm -hmm. But some elements, like the tapestry cards specifically, some of the civilizations you might get, or even some of the different regions of gameplay may not be as rewarding or efficient at getting you to that end victory as you might want. So if you're looking for a game that is interesting and fun to play, Tapestry may be right for you. Mm -hmm. That being said, if you're looking at something that always feels 100% fair, that has 100% of information available, or doesn't rely on a little bit of adaptation and randomness in terms of who ends up winning, this game may not quite fit the bill. No. The next thing we want to dive into is going to be the modes of play. Uh, Tapestry is billed as a 1 to 5 player game, ages 12 plus, and it's supposed to play in about 90 to 120 minutes based on how many people you have at the table. I can say as a solo player, the Atoma Factory that's tied to Stonemeyer Games that exists in, I think, the majority of their games mm -hmm. is interesting in this game. Uh, it gives you the same feeling of progression. You're able to really kind of min-max and figure out what a good strategy might be uh, if you want to go home and try to beat the people that you're playing the table with. Mm -hmm. This is a efficiency manager. So as a solo player, if you enjoy efficiency managers, this has a mechanic and a system that will work well for you. As far as player counts themselves, it's a dual-sided yeah. board, mm -hmm. so it does accommodate smaller to larger groups, and it does change the game state when doing so. Yep. 
Uh, but what do you feel when playing with more players? So I think one of the sweet spots with this game is going to be anywhere between two to three. And that's because when you add a fourth and fifth player, the income rounds can become very long. There's a lot of things that kind of happen, chain reactions that go about, and it could make the game a little bit slower. And especially with players that might have analysis paralysis, and God forbid you don't have two of those in a single game, you might be looking at a very long playtime, which this game does not do well under. Yeah, I, I think I would agree that, that that kind of one to three zone is gonna be the sweet spot of this game. This game largely feels like you're solving a puzzle yourself, mm -hmm. which I enjoy quite a bit as long as I'm able to continue solving that puzzle. When you add four or five players into the mix, the game state becomes a little bit more chaotic. You're interacting with other players, which may fit into that Civ theme a little bit better, but I don't think it actually fits into this game quite as well. Yeah, and one of the most important things to note is that we would only recommend four to five players with all experienced players on, in the table. I think that's fair. If you have experienced players that are able to make quick decisions and know what's going mm -hmm. on, uh, this is one that can certainly be rewarding at those higher player counts. I think really does require a little bit of experience to get the full benefits of. So if you're fine with games that require specific criteria to play at large play counts, this... It might be right for you. And if you're looking for a game that plays really well at one to two players, it this still might be right for you. Now the real question is gonna come down to then if they've watched to this point and <laughs> they're still figuring out if this is right or wrong for them, innovation. What yeah. stands out? Does this game do anything kind of shockingly new in this space? That's tricky to say, but I do think it's a really different take on civilization type of games and I welcome that. Mm. Um, I think our hobby in general merits this type of exploration. Regardless if it's successful or not, it's important that people are taking a look at how to bring in different experiences. And I think for sure, this brings a different experience, not necessarily something incredibly new in terms of its mechanics, but the feeling and the progression, the way that you're reaching those goals definitely does feel unique. I, I think there's two areas that I could say are at least slightly innovative. Uh, the first is going to be tied to the production quality itself. Now, this isn't the first game that has been yeah. aggressively produced. It's not the first game with painted miniatures. It's not the first game with sort of uh, velvety, uh, sandpaper-like player cards. We've seen other companies like Chip Theory Games mm -hmm. and even some, some Stonemaier games in the past do similar things. But this one really does stand out in the sense that every component is thoughtful, works well, and is designed really nice. This is gonna tie into the price at the end. <laughs> it is a higher price tag because it is produced really well. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the B-roll we have displays that. I don't know that it's innovative, but it is certainly setting the bar and upping the standards for what people expect out of their board games. And that also has a negative because maybe people don't want that type of expense in their board games. Sure. I know that for sure I'm not a big fan of increasing prices in our hobby. Well, that's something to consider. Uh, the other area that I think isn't necessarily innovative but is worth pointing out is it does a decent job at managing a lot of different things mm -hmm. during the game state and keeping it fairly simple. Yep. We have a kind of war and conquer mechanic happening. We have a economy and resource kind of management happening. We have a asymmetric element with the player cards and the tapestry cards. We have a spatial awareness puzzle over here. There's a lot of different items mm -hmm. or a lot of different mechanics happening in this game. And it's not the first to do this, but I think it does it really well. And I do want to give it a little bit of credit for that balance that it's struck. So if this game being not aggressively innovative, mm -hmm. but working on a few different mechanics, balancing them out really well, having a incredible production quality and touching a genre that doesn't see this type of exploration mm -hmm. as often, seems like something you might be interested in, this game still might be right for you. The final question, the determining factor, which mm. we foreshadowed slightly, is going to come down to the price of this game. If you'd been a fan club member of Stonemaier Games, this would have fetched you a hefty $80. Yeah. If you're buying it from retail, you're looking at a crisp $100 bill to pick up this copy mm -hmm. of the game. What's your sense of that price point and 
Do you think that's a make or break factor when it comes to this type of game? Yes, 100%. Okay. I, I do. I, I believe that 80 was pushing it. Mm -hmm. uh, 80 felt like a very difficult decision for me because I had no idea if I would end up enjoying the game. And for the type of experimental nature that it had, I was fearful of that commitment. Thankfully for me, I ultimately came out of this happy. But I know for sure that if I paid over a hundred dollars for this, including shipping, it would have been an immediate no. I, that would have the bar is set too high for what I feel this game is bringing to the table. Yes, the components are fascinating, the gameplay is solid, but at a hundred dollars, we're, we're we're talking about heavy euro territory. On the other side of that, though, this game isn't pitching itself to aggressive heavy board gamers. In a way, it. it it's selling itself more to people who are maybe just getting into this genre of game that maybe will be bringing this to the table more often than not. And at $100 for a production quality this high and for a system that rewards bringing it to the table as often as you should if you're going to own it, I don't know that that's entirely crazy. Well, I, I know that if I'm a fledgling gamer and you tell me that one of the best entry barrier games is $100, I'd be immediately disinterested in even entering the hobby. I feel games like Six and Nimit and all these other smaller titles is what really brings in new players into our wonderful hobby. Having something like this that is essentially catering to that crowd mm -hmm. but being so high and difficult to get access to, I feel actually disincentivizes anyone from even participating. Yeah, I think it's an interesting thing to consider. I think there is certainly and clearly a market for those kind of mid-range to lower price range games in terms of pulling people into the hobby. I do think though with a growing community and a growing fan base that are investing resources into what is uh, all the time kind of a additional expense or an additional budgetary item, uh, these are luxury goods. Yeah, and yeah. so I don't genuinely have a problem with it being treated as a luxury good. And at the end of the day, the market will be what ends up deciding it. And you, the viewer, based on everything that we've just gone over, will have to make the ultimate decision. <laughs> is this game, is what we've described, the components, the production quality, the gameplay itself, interesting enough that you want to spend that $100 on it? Or is that price tag just a little bit too high? I'd genuinely love to have a conversation with you about that in the comment section down below. It is probably one of the bigger questions around this game. Yep. I think if you're going to get this game to the table, if it seems intriguing to you, if you know you're gonna be able to get it off your shelf, I don't know that I'd blink an eye at $100. That being said, if it's gonna live on your shelf, if you're not gonna open it, if you maybe wanna play it once or twice, I think there it probably isn't worth that first time experience. That's a big ask. Because the 10th game is gonna be significantly better than the first. Mm -hmm. And that's just the case with this one. Yep. Whatever the case, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Let us know how this format works for you. And if we helped you come up with a decision around picking up this game or not, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Your support here on this video helps us continue to create and produce different types of videos. Mainly what we're doing here on this channel is experimenting with things that we would like to see in the industry mm -hmm. and things that we would hopefully benefit from ourselves. Uh, whatever you do, remember to do the important thing. Get out and play some games. We'll see you next time. Thank you.